modes, so buses, tramway, trolley buses, metro, and so on. Uh, some data from uh, Astra World. Uh, we have uh, 144 um, associate members and we represent the 95% of the uh, market uh, of urban transport and 75% of extra urban transport with 5 billion of passengers per year and 9 billion of euro of turnover. And what we do? Uh, we act uh, to create awareness of policymaker and public opinion on the social, economical and environmental role of local public transport according to the principle of sustainable development. And ASRA offers its member a wide spectrum of services uh, such as uh, consulting in legal, economical, financial and tax uh, items and uh, we represent the interest of uh, our member in front of, of uh, the authorities, policy makers, trade unions, uh, and the organization uh, which acts in economical, political, and social field, both at the national and uh, European and international in general level. And uh, dealing with the um, elliptic uh, use cases, uh, the coordinator already gave you a uh, and an overview on the uh, activities uh, of our project. So we have three thematic three pillars and we deal with the pillar B today. And uh, uh, since we are the coordinator and uh, the subject is uh, upgrading and uh, regenerating electric public transport system. And uh, the main goal are to analyze my energy management concept for upgrading our existing electric public transport infrastructure. In particular, we would like to define optimize energy management as a station in combination with recuperating of breaking energy and urgent solution for key buses and other e vehicles. Then to identify the potential of using ICT for smart and more efficient energy management and to demonstrate the key technologies in re relevant environment for increased operational and energy efficiency. For instance, flywheel energy storage device in trolleybuses or tram substation and reversible substation for light rail or, la or light rail tram operation on rail track for rural public transport. We have uh, three use cases in our pillar and um, that deals with the demonstration in operational environment or just a feasibility study. And for the first category we have Bremen that uh, deals with the recuperation of breaking energy from trams and in particular the refurbishment of the flywheel energy storage system. For feasibility study we have two examples uh, that are Brussels that we will talk uh, deeply later and then Lanciano that uh, deals with the light rail uh, tram operation for rural traffic. Going deeply into the Bremen use case we have that the objective are uh, deals with the, the problem of public transport provider that are interested in uh, reducing the power demand of the trans system and uh, how they solve this uh, kind of issue uh, by reusing the braking power of trans cars. In fact, nowadays the braking power is um, only used at uh, 30 percent and to use the braking current mode efficiently stationary flywheel energy storage system can be a solution. And the uh, flywheel storage system are able to store breaking energy with, uh, which can be used for an accelerating tram at the same section of the line <coughs> as kinetic energy of rotation. The energy is stored until another tram in the same section of the line needs much power for instance, uh, in the acceleration phase. The tram with the high power demand will then be partly provided uh, with the power from the flywheel. Such a flywheel energy storage system 
was already <laughs> installed in Bremen in uh, 2012, but uh, the provider of the technology went bankrupt uh, and uh, so the, the test could never be insured. And uh, in order to support the company from Bremen, uh, future proofing and sustainability strategy of reducing fossil fuel consumption and to meet the target of efficient use of innovative vehicle technology, the reoperation and the refurbishment of the storage system is planned uh, during this, uh, this project. And this will require the, a detailed analysis of the existing system and the current technical operation development and solution. Then, uh, dealing with the Lanciano use case, uh, we know that it focuses on a feasibility study, as we said, that uh, will uh, analyze, will focus on the implementation of a new urban tramway system by upgrading the existing red network that uh, is from the company Tua. The aim of the use case is to provide an urban tramway through the use of train routes uh, that, uh, as we said, already exist in Tua, with the intention to use the railway line San Vito Marina, Lanciano Crocetta for the tram type services uh, that you can see in the, in the map. And the objective is to reuse uh, the existing railway infrastructure that is no longer uh, used to provide a uh, tram type service uh, which will be characterized by high accessibility by users, thanks to the low floor, and high commercial speed, that will be the result of high performance in acceleration and deceleration, and less impact on traffic and roads in the town, since uh, uh, will not be required any street crossing. Furthermore, in order to overcome poten potential interference with other existing infrastructure, the study will consider the potential for uh, introducing an energy storage system as well. So the feasibility study to demonstrate uh, the possibility to increase the accessibility of inland areas and the relationship between neighboring towns and um, discourage uh, car use and improve local air quality that together will lead to uh, reducing pollution and congestion. And uh, finally, to enhance the accessibility of local public transport and implement the functional integration of transport mode. Um, I don't go deep in the Brussels use case since uh, we will have recap the presentation later. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you for this uh, general introduction. Um, I would say if there are any general questions regarding the Pillar B objectives and maybe the use cases. Uh, so Veronica presented two of three of uh, the use cases from Pillar B, so the one from Bremen regarding a flywheel um, implementation or let's see, say re-implementation also from Lanciano. Please use the questions uh, function and then we can use also the uh, question and answer session later to answer these questions if you have any. So in the agenda I would now continue with Ricardo's presentation and make you now Ricardo the presenter. Okay. Okay, perfect. Then Okay, so everybody can see my screen properly now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, so good morning to everybody. And this is Ricardo Barrero speaking for the Brussels Public Transport Operator. As Wolfgang said in the introduction, uh, we are involved in Pillar B of Elliptic, where we are studying the possibilities to, to improve the braking energy of the trams in our networks. And in the past, we were also involved in, the, in a similar project where we studied the metro, one of the metro lines, and eventually we installed some reversible substations. So what I wanted to, to do today is to explain to you the methodology that we used and to give you some feedback on the, on the systems we have installed on the metro network that um, were the, the result of the Ticket to Kyoto project. Um, after that, I will give you an extrapolation of the approach that we are going to, to, to use for elliptic for the tram network. 
So I, I guess that most of you are familiar already with the technologies that are used to recover the, the breaking energy on the, um, on the urban rails. Um, but anyhow, I will give you a brief description. So you know that in uh, most of the urban rails networks, uh, they are fed uh, by DC traction substations. These traction substations, uh, most of them are diode substations, which are irreversible. And it means that we cannot send the energy back to the network. So when the vehicles are trying to, to brake, they can convert the, the kinetic energy into electricity. And actually, they try to send the energy to to another vehicles within the catenary. So this is only possible if uh, when the vehicle is braking and trying to send the energy to, to other vehicles, um, there is another vehicle that is accelerating, that means consuming energy nearby. If this is not possible, uh, then that energy is, uh, is wasted, it's, it's dissipated as heat in the braking resistors of the vehicle. And actually it's that energy that we are aiming, we want to capture that energy and we have several options. We can do that with energy storage. The energy storage can be on board the vehicle. When the vehicle brakes, it charges. And then when the vehicle um, accelerates again, it detects a voltage drop and then it discharges, helping the acceleration of the vehicle. We can also use a stationary energy storage system. The concept is similar, but the, uh, the systems, they are not on board the vehicle. They are connected to the catenary in some section. And um, again, when they detect that the voltage goes up, it means that there's, there's some vehicle freaking that cannot send the energy to, to another vehicle. And uh, what they do is they, they store that energy to release it later. The third option are the reversible substation. In this case, um, they don't store the energy of the vehicles, but they send it back uh, to, the, um, to the medium voltage line, to the medium voltage network. And once the energy is there, it's, it's consumed instantaneously. The energy is not stored, but uh, that energy is sent to, to other loads. Just um, a little schematic to, to summarize how that works. Imagine we have a simple network uh, with two vehicles. Tram 1 is trying to send energy to Tram 2, but it's too far away, so it can only send a very small portion of energy represented here. So that energy is, uh, is, is dissipated in the braking resistors on board the vehicle. But if we have a, a reversible substation or an energy storage system, they detect that and then they try to capture that energy. In the case of a reversible substation, the energy would go through the inverter that is in parallel with the, with the diode rectifier. It goes back to the, to the medium voltage uh, network. In our case, we are the owners of the 11 kilovolt networks, and that means that we can consume that energy internally to power the buildings, uh, other traction substations, uh, metro stations, escalators, lighting, whatever. And um, if we want to give a um, very rough overview of the different technologies, um, well, somehow we have the energy storage technologies. They are able to, um, to reduce the line, the, the losses on the line on the catenary because with the energy they store, they can use it later to reduce the, the energy that, um, that goes through the line, the energy that is given by the substations. And this is especially marked for the um, onboard, for the mobile energy storage system. Um, one advantage of reversible substation, in principle, is that uh, you don't have to um, store and, uh, and this, well, to charge and discharge the batteries, the flywheel, or the supercapacitors. So somehow you don't have the, the losses associated to that process. However, you have losses as well when you convert the energy from DC to AC. But in principle, those losses are slightly lower than, um, than the ones you have in all the process of the energy storage. One, uh, one advantage that is particular of the um, onboard energy storage system is that you could use for some um, portion of the line uh, your tram or your metro or your trolley bus uh, without a a catenary or a feeding system. That happens, I think, in some cities like Bordeaux, where they don't want to, to, to have like the catenary lines in the historic centers. You can have some onboard energy storage and, uh, and use it to propel the vehicle for a short distance. Um, but the, the disadvantage uh, of mobile energy storage systems is that sometimes it's difficult to retrofit existing vehicles. 
So in that case, it's, a, it's much easier for the operator to, to install stationary energy storage systems or reversible substations because you don't have to, to touch the vehicles. And uh, well, the, another important advantage of uh, storage systems, the, the latest one, is that you can use those systems not only to recover your braking energy to improve your efficiency, but also to reduce the voltage drops on your line. That eventually it can, it could help you to not install so many substations in case you have voltage problems. Now I will explain briefly the methodology that, uh, that we used for, um, for our metro study during the Ticket to Kyoto project. So basically what we want to do is to, to, to estimate what's the potential of energy savings if we want to invest in one of these technologies. So to, to do that estimation, uh, we can do two things. We can do a um, theoretical study through simulations and we can do some measurements. Uh, the measurements, um, we can use them also to validate the, our simulation tool. And one important measurement that, uh, that we want to take is uh, the braking energy that is dissipated on the onboard resistors on the vehicles. Why is that? Because it's this energy that we are aiming to recover. If we know how much energy is, uh, is dissipated on the resistors, we know what is our maximum potential to, to save. In reality, um, it's well. I, I would say it's impossible to recover all that energy, but we can aim to to save uh, like 90 or 95 percent of, of that energy that is dissipated, depending on the system that uh, that we are using. Then, well, some other um, measures that we can take is the energy that uh, is being used for traction for the uh, for the vehicles, the auxiliary consumption, uh, the energy regenerated that is being sent back to the network in, in regular conditions. And um, we can also take some measurements at substation level. These measurements can be used later to, um, to, to validate the simulation tool. Uh, when we do simulations, what we do, we are building a model of the network uh, as it is. And uh, when I say as it is, it means like a conventional network without energy recovery technologies, because we want to validate that with the measurements uh, that we took. Once it's validated, uh, we introduce the models of the um, energy recovery technologies, the uh, supercapacitors, flywheels, batteries, or the reversible size stations. We introduce them in the model and we run simulations. And what we want to, to find out is how much energy we can save and uh, how many systems we need to achieve that. So once we know that, then we can go to the business case. The, the energy savings per year, it, tells us what are the benefits that we are going to have during the lifetime of that system. Then we have the, the investment cost of the technology that we chose. Imagine we chose to have a five um, supercapacitor-based energy storage system, so we have to go to the supplier and ask how much would that be, how much would be the maintenance per year, and then other costs that uh, could be the installation, the CO2 emissions, etc. And with that, then we have a, an economic indicator that can help us decide whether the investment uh, is worth or not. So I will go very fast through the through the network modeling slides. Uh, this is a very simplified schematic of our metro network. Every segment is fed by, by two substations. We want to model that, and we also want to introduce the different braking energy recovery technologies that onboard the energy storage, stationary energy storage, and reversible substations. Uh, we do it like a simplified mathematical model. Looks like something like this. We have to solve this system, and uh, when we solve it, then um, we want to validate it with the measurements that uh, that we took. So here you see. At vehicle level, uh, the, the powers at the current that we measure and the, and the powers and the current that uh, we estimated, after a fine tuning, it matched pretty well. So after um, after we used that, um, we decided to to introduce the the energy storage systems. Well, we also did some validation at the substation level, and uh, finally, once this was validated energetically. What you want to have is, a, is the amount of energy that you could save when you have your, a certain amount of energy recovery systems. And you want to know as well how many of those systems you have to install. So here on the horizontal axis, 
you see the name of the 14 substations that are powering one of our metro lines here in Brussels. And um, in the vertical line, you see the amount of energy that the inverter installed there is recovering. You see that for, for, for each substation, you see four different lines. And that is because we run four different simulations uh, with uh, every time with different random delays between trains, so just to avoid some unwanted synchronizations between the between the trains. Um, what you can see is that some substations uh, perform worse than the others, let's say, and what we are doing is, for instance, you see this one where the inverter doesn't recover much energy, we remove it, and then we see how the, the rest of the inverter behave and what we see is that uh, when we are removing inverters the rest of the inverters they are increasing the amount of energy they, they recover and that is because there is an overlap over the different inverters for instance is this inverter here it could recover energy that comes from trains that are around the substation and this other one and that's why we see that the inverter perform better when there are less of them installed on the line and at the end you want to arrive to some sort of, um, of curve like this, where you see the energy savings. This is uh, an extrapolation of annual energy savings in megawatt hours in function of the number of inverters that uh, you decided to, to install. Remind you that we have 14 substations. So in this case, we see that uh, when we install two inverters for six, the, um, the energy savings in Increase uh, with a steep slope. However, after six, eight inverters, the gains are less visible. So we see that a trade-off solution when we do the economic study it was somewhere here between six and eight inverters. And well, after the explanation of the of the methodology we used to to evaluate it, I'm going to explain a bit more the. The, the, the practical process where we launched a tender to to have this uh, to buy these breaking energy recovery technologies, reversible substations, and um, we we launched the tender and it was answered by eight companies. Three of them made it to the to the final stage. They were um, AEG, Angetim, and Siemens. And then um, we asked each company to propose a solution and give us the estimation of the savings. The, the problem with this is that it's difficult to, to compare the, um, the proposal of each company based on their estimation of savings because somehow you have to benchmark it. So in this case, we had this um, uh, approved by, um, by the university in this case. And uh, what I would recommend if you do this is to have this checked by some independent or external consultant to make sure that the proposals uh, of the different companies are on the same page. So after a few discussions with all the, all the companies, they came to the, the latest proposal. It was quite similar from the three of them. And uh, at that time, the Steve decided to, to test, the, well, to buy one system from each and to test them on the, on the same conditions, on the same substations. So we installed the three systems on one of the substations. And uh, for a period, I think it was between two or three months, we were um, testing the different systems uh, one day from each company. So one day it was the system of AEG, the other day it was the system of Angel Team, and the other way from Siemens, like that for three months. And also, uh, we wanted to, to see what happened um, when the systems are working and when the systems uh, are not working. Because actually, when we have a reversible substation, um, it implies a slight consumption increase in the substation. That's, a, that, that's always going to happen. But uh, if we want to estimate the real savings, we, we have to know what's the energy that's been uh, recovered by the inverter. And on the other hand, we need to know what's the increase of the consumption of the substation. And uh, the difference between those two is actually the real savings. That's why every day, Every system was working for 15 minutes, and then it was in standby mode for another 15 minutes. So after the test, we saw that one of the companies um, was performing better than the others. You see here this blue line. It means actually it was the the energy savings from NG team um, in the different days. So finally, we decided to buy six systems in total from from this company. 
and with the, the simulation results were in line more or less with the results that we saw for one system in that substation and then the estimated payback time at that time was five years considering the electricity prices we had in, in 2012. And this has slightly changed now because the electricity price has, uh, has decreased in the, in the last years. And uh, some of you might be wondering how does it look like a reversible substation. So it's a cabinet like that. I can tell you this is more or less like two point something meters. Uh, the thickness is 1.2 meters and this is about one meter. So in total, the length is about three meters. We have a, from every supplier, it was more or less always the same. We have a, an inverter cabinet, a transformer, and then the, and the last one is the inputs and output terminals and the um, DC and AC circuit breakers for protection. You can see um, a picture of the same system with some of my colleagues from Steve and from Dublin uh, in a visit during the Twinning Cities activity of Elliptic. And I, would, I wanted to show you here is that um, we can install the three cabinets uh, in different places. For instance, here we have the inverter next to the wall because we didn't have physical space in the substation to put them all together. And the other ones, here there is another, another cabinet and you don't see the, the third one. Connections are um, below the raised floor. Now let me show you some results of the energy that was recovered by the inverters in 2014. Um, you see a big difference between the first half of the year and the second half. This is because during the first half um, we were working alternating the systems uh, every week from one company and we were also having them working only like half of the time, 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. After June, we decided to install only one of the systems that was working continuously. So, so that we can say from June until October was the normal working mode. The inverters were extracting about uh, between 50 and 80 megawatt hours per month. And then in November, during some maintenance operation, we had a problem with one of the cables connecting the system. We had a, a short circuit. And well, the system was not damaged, but uh, we didn't want to put it in service again until it was checked by, by the by the by the manufacturer. So that's why you didn't see any any figure for December. This is our metro network map. Um, this is our line six, which is uh, equipped with inverters. You see the dots represent where the inverters are installed, and the ones in green means the one that are already installed service and uh, these ones are already in, in place but they are not uh, the decommissioning has not taken place it will be done uh, normally before the summer and uh, an extrapolation to the elliptic approach basically the, the approach is very similar but the, the difference being that uh, the complexity of the tram network is much higher than the complexity of the metro network why is that? Because uh, the tram network is much bigger. Uh, we have interconnection of lines, have substations that are feeding several lines. The feeders connect the different sections uh, a, li a little bit, no matter how. It's not like in the metro that we all, they were always connected to each end of every electrical section. And also the trams are sometimes, many times, uh, mixed with the car traffic. And then, um, well, another thing that, of course, we want to use is the feedback from the real performance of the systems that are installed in the in the metro lines. This is the lines uh, we are going to to study for elliptic. This tram line seven here in yellow. It goes from the north of the city here. If you follow me, it goes down to here. This is a long line. It's a line that has um, a lot of tunnel sections and dedicated sections. So let's say it's a fast line. We have line 94. It has a strong occupancy in this portion of the line till the university, but after this uh, there is not much occupancy and the um, speeds are also high. And then a neighborhood line, line 19, that uh, doesn't pass through the center. The occupation is not very big either, but, uh, but the speeds are, are high. Now let me show you a quick comparative uh, between the metro and the tram networks. Well, the, the main difference being the speeds and the size of the vehicle. Because of that, um, the power that the vehicles, uh, the nominal power of the metro vehicles, it's somehow higher than two megawatts. However, on the trams, our 
uh, largest trams, they, they have a nominal power of 600 kilowatts. Most of the trams, however, are around 400. As I mentioned before, the, the electric network is very regular on the metro lines. It's, uh, it's very regular, however, for the tram. Other difference that we're expecting is the auxiliary consumption in the metro, since they are in tunnels, uh, they are not so affected by the weather. However, the trams, we expect um, some higher consumption for cooling and, um, and heating. And, well, the other difference is not so important, but is the voltage level is 900 DC in the metro, 700 uh, for the tram. And then let me show you our timeline for, uh, for elliptic. So this is where we are now. Uh, it means that um, we are we started already with the with the modeling of the network. So far we have done the selection of the lines, state of the art review of different um, energy recovery technologies and uh, simulation tools. We have analyzed the network to see how we can approach the the study, and we've made a, a quick comparative of the of the metro and the tram network. What we have to do so far is the network model. We already started, but it, this takes some time. The measurements that are ongoing, we have already some measurements from substation, and in the coming weeks, we will have, uh, hopefully, some research on the vehicles. And, um, and then once we have that, well, we hope to, to use the simulation tool to get the results, do the business case, and finally, um, we will do the reporting of all that. So, as the, as the summary and the, the conclusions, so I think that what we can tell you from the, the lessons we learned from Ticket to Kyoto is that um, the control of the systems in real life, that, that is very important. So, we saw that the same hardware, even the same systems, they really change their performance when they are changing the control thresholds and when they optimize it. So, it, it's important to have a um, somebody, some company that have an expertise on that, and um, also that they are reactive, that uh, if you see that, uh, well, you have to check how the, your system is doing. If you see that some month or some week the energy recovery is very low, then you have to, to contact them and they have to, to try to solve it again and, or at least see what the problem is. And uh, another thing is that, well, the, the, the results, they depend on so many parameters that it's difficult to extrapolate it from one network to, to the other. And finally, for elliptic, as we spoke a little bit about the, the methodology, well, we will use a similar methodology as we used for the, for the metro network. And uh, we will have also some feedback from the, from the real reversal substations installed. Can use it to have real measurements. And also we can, well, imagine that uh, the real results that we obtain from uh, ticket to Kyoto, uh, they are not as good as we expected, then well, we'll have to be a bit more careful when we have the results of the study of the tram network. So that was uh, all from my side. I hope it was uh, interesting for you. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any question, feel free to ask now, or um, you can send it to me by email or to my colleague Benjamin in the emails that you see on the screen. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo, for this presentation. Um, so now we have the time for questions, um, and Ricardo will, is willing to answer them. And uh, also, if there are some questions related to the introductory presentations by Astra or me, you can also feel free to ask them now. Uh, please use the question function, or now we can also just uh, use the raise your hand function. So if you have a question, raise your hand, either raise your hand or fill in a question in the questions function. Um, so far we have uh, so far we have one question. Oh no, let's see. We have now received meanwhile more questions. There's one question to Veronica. Um, it's regarding the example from Bremen. The question is if you know if the 13% uh, recuperation rate or receptivity rate, if it is measured, uh, a measured value or it's only empirical or let's say theoretical one. Um, not sure if you, Veronica, can say something about this. 
Otherwise, we could maybe ask colleagues from BRIM, which are also online. Veronica? Yeah, uh, well, if, um, is there someone from Bremen? Maybe they, because it's um, a data that comes from them, so maybe they okay. can explain it better. Yeah, we we haven't. Uh, hi, Wolfgang. Daniela is speaking. We we haven't updating about this. So uh, we we present. Veronica presents the data that uh, at this time we have. Uh, okay. Probably they are updating the heat. Okay, thank you. I will uh, ask um, Helmut, maybe, who is supporting uh, the Bremen uh, public transport operator in the elliptic project. Good morning, Helmut. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, it's quite low, but we can hear you. Do you have a, um, an answer to this question? Otherwise, uh, I would suggest I will get this information and uh, come back to Suleiman, who asked, asked this question. Yeah, that's the best. I just wanted to phone the colleague from the Bremer Straßenbahn AG to ask this question. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. So they should not know. Okay, good. I mean, uh, from what I understood from the meetings with uh, Bremer um, public transport operators so far, it was a measured data, but um, to be sure, we will contact them and then come back to you, Soleiman, with the... Yeah, good idea. Okay. Uh, Wolfgang, maybe I can add something from, from the case of Brussels uh, yes, to, okay. to help with this question. Um, actually, uh, we, we did some measurements on some of the trains and um, we measured that in function of the traffic conditions, the, the vehicles, in our case, uh, they could recover around more than actually 30 up to 35% of the energy they consume for traction. Mm -hmm. That 35% of that energy, they send it back to other vehicles on the network. But that happens mostly in the peak times when there are a lot of vehicles on the line. Uh, however, when the, the traffic is lower, we have that uh, these are measured values, and uh, we have around 20, a bit less than 25%. The maximum potential depends on, uh, on many things, but I think you can reach up to up around 40% of the energy used for traction you could recover if the, your network was receptive. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for this uh, clarification or the answer. There is also a direct question to, re to you, Ricardo, also from Suleiman. Um, he asked uh, approximately 60 megawatt hour saving per month means around five to 6,000 euro savings. Um, a five years payback time gives around a cost of approximately 300,000 euro. What was the measured recepti uh, receptivity rate for the metro? I think you... Uh, the, actually, yeah. the calculation is, um, is, is pretty much correct. Yeah, and yeah. Um, the, the prices of the systems, they, they were, in, depending on the, uh, on the supplier, between 200 and 300,000 euros, more or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I cannot hear or see more questions, um, not sure if there are more. Just check if someone raised his hand. There was, yes, there's someone. Um, Maurits Hacking, is this correct? Can you hear me? I just unmuted you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Maybe you Hi. could just shortly say um, um, yeah, where you question, are then I call. before you raise, before yeah. ask your question. Yeah, um, my name is Moritz. I'm uh, from GVB, the public transport operator in Amsterdam. Um, first of all, thank, thank you very much for the clear presentations. I think uh, um, it's it's very helpful for us. We're also looking at. Uh, um, breaking energy uh, recuperation ourselves, and uh, this is very valuable input. I was just wondering, um, in relation to the last presentation, um, at the start you um, indicated there were three technologies you were researching, um, um, on station, on board, and uh, using the um, uh, uh, reversible uh, stations. Um, are you looking at all three technologies as well in terms of the trams? 
Um, and if so, especially when you're looking at onboard storage, which might be interesting, are there any issues with weight? Because that, that seems to be a problem for us um, of adding extra uh, batteries to the tram. So those were the, the, the sort of questions I had, and I'd uh, very much like to talk you further to see what uh, relevant information you might have for us. Okay, thank you very much, Maurits. Uh, so I think this question is directed to Ricardo. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, for um, for elliptic for the tram network, in in principle, we were only looking at the at the reversible substations. Um, well, the reason being that we can send that energy and consume it uh, ourselves. But if uh, during the course of the simulations or the measurements we see, for instance, that we have problems, imagine with uh, with voltage drops that the voltage gets too low in some portions of the line, we still might reconsider the use of um, energy storage. But in principle, only for that purpose. Um, to come back to your second question, it was regarding the the, the weight problems when um, when you install these systems. Uh, I don't have direct uh, experience with that, but uh, I guess that uh, well, the, those systems that you are going to put on board the tram or the metro, they can easily be 500 kilos or more. So if they are going to be installed on the roof, and then you are going to install them on vehicles that were not designed for that, then uh, my guess is that you will need to retrofit uh, probably the structure as well. So I guess that's something you have to, to talk with the, with the manufacturer. That, that's why I pointed out that's one of the disadvantages when you have existing vehicles already and you want to yeah. modify them with these systems. It's it's a bit more complex than uh, than with the others. But however, right. if you are thinking of buying um, some more new vehicles to put them on a line, that might be a good occasion to consider the option of buying already the vehicles right. with these integrated uh, energy storages. Right. Okay. Thank you, Thank Ricardo, you. for this question. And there's. Uh, let's say related question to this from David Powell. Um, he asked if these, if you did some simulation work also to model onboard storage systems uh, for the Metro um, and if not, if your software or your simulation tool could be used for this purpose. Um, yes, actually I did that in the, um, not for the STI, but I did it on the framework of, uh, of my PhD. Um, I, I, well, I can use the, the simulation tool to, to model the three systems and I don't remember the results by heart but um, what I, I remember the, the big lines is that when we had the onboard energy storage systems we were able to recover more, uh, more energy than with the other systems because we don't have the restriction of the distance between the vehicle and the, and the stationary energy storage system or the reversible substation it means that we can store directly all the energy that uh, we generate during braking. That was the advantage. The disadvantage was that uh, I think that the price of uh, installing onboard energy storage system on, on board all your vehicles would be, I think, higher than installing like a um, stationary and reversible, well, sorry, stationary energy storage systems along the line. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for this answer. Um, uh, when when was your PhD done? I mean, maybe on the in the onboard technologies, there is also a development and a price dropping. But yeah, yeah, for sure, it's, yeah. it's been some time that has passed. Um, I think I studied this like in 2010, more or less. Mm -hmm. So I think these technologies evolve quite fast. So so probably there is already a difference in all that. Okay, then uh, th I think for the for the moment we would uh, uh, end then this session. Thank you once again very much, Ricardo, for this interesting presentation. Um, if you have further questions to um, Ricardo, you can either write me an email um, and we forward it, or uh, when we um, publish the presentations, you also have Ricardo's um, email contact and can ask him questions directly. So, thank you very much. Now we continue with the uh, trolleybus um, presentation from Mikolai. Um, Mikolai, I will now unmute you and make you the presenter. Hello for everyone again. My name is Mikolai Bart. Hello.
Hello for everyone again. My name is Mikolai Bartolmicic. I work at Tribus Transport Company of Gdynia in Poland. Except Tribus Transport Company, I work as a researcher at Technical University of Gdańsk in Electrotechnical Faculty. And today I'm going to share with you with some of our experiences with reducing of the energy consumption in public tribus transport. And uh, I'm going to say something about super cap energy storage devices tests which were performed and which are still being performed in Gdynia and also about introducing of the some smart grid technologies in supply system of trolley buses. Our tribal transport company started adventure with SuperCap energy storage system in 2010-2011 year. And uh, in 2011 year we in cooperation with in cooperation with Electrotechnical Institute in Warsaw, we installed one supercapacity energy storage system which was it was test super capacity energy storage system. It was for only for test purposes. And uh, it was installed on the one of our traction substation, which is called Punocna. It is the biggest traction substation. And it was the capacitance of the storage energy system was rather small. It was only 0 0.7 kilowatt hours. The maximal power also was rather small, the main purpose of the installation of this uh, device was to get some experience, practical experience from the exploitation of supercapacity energy storage system. And there are, here you see some photos from the construction, from the preparation of this first supercapacitor energy system in Electrotechnical Institute in Warsaw. Here, here are supercap modules. There were four supercap modules. Here is construction, under construction. And here there is supercapacity energy storage system just already installed in traction substation. Here is the room with uh, DC 600 voltage equipment and there is DC 600 switchboard of tri-bus substation, two rectifiers and there is one mm, energy storage system and it is not very big because the capacitance was rather small and here you see this storage system inside, there are one, two, three, four um, supercapacitor mm -hmm. modules and also there are other there are other elements like DC-DC converter and control system. And exploitation of this uh, the energy saving wasn't very big because uh, the main was this uh, it was it is the big the biggest substation in Gdynia so the most of recuperated energy is used by other vehicles is consumed by other vehicles but the main reason of installing of this installation was to get some practical experiences as well as I said and uh, this practical experiences helped us for preparation for taking part in the another project. It was Dynamo, Civitas Dynamo project. And in the frame of this project, we, ins we installed the second one, biggest one, supercapacity, bigger supercapacity energy storage system in another substation, in Wielkopolska substation. The capacitance of this storage system was bigger, it was one and a half kilowatt hours, also the maximal peak power was bigger and this super capacitor energy storage system was installed two years ago in 2013 and this super capacitor energy storage system was installed in one small container, small traction substation in here which supplies the Healy part of the Gdynia. Here is, uh, here is hilly part, so the amount of recuperated energy is quite big. It was the reason why this supercapacity energy storage system was installed just here. Here is the main scheme of this supercapacity energy storage system. This storage system was built by War Polish 
company from Warsaw which also delivers the traction equipment for trolley buses in Gdynia and for other cities with tram and trolley buses. And uh, as every other super capacity energy storage system, the main element is also, of course, super capacitors. There is DC-DC converters which controls charging and discharging of these super capacitors. There is supply, this connection with uh, supply system with traction station and also there is discharging register. And here are some photos. Here you see substation with support with fragment of the supercapacity super energy storage system. It's part of the supercapacity energy system, part it means DC-DC converter and control system were installed inside in this substation. And supercapacity modules were installed outside of this substation. So here you see there is small traction substation, trolley construction substation. Outside of the substation there are supercapacity modules in this small container and also here is, there is discharging resistor for discharging in emergency situation of these modules. And how does it look like the supercapacity modules inside? This is just this container opened. And there are 15, yes, there are 15 supercapacity modules. And as I said, DC-DC converter and control system is installed inside the substation. So this substation in photo of inside. And here is the second part of this storage energy system. The, another photo also, it is inside of this substation. Here is high voltage. 15 kilovolts volt switchboard, here is 600 DC volt switchboard and here is DC-DC converter and control system of um, this storage energy system. And uh, I will present the most important reason, results of this, of exploitation of this uh, supercapacity energy storage system. Here is comparison gained after measurement released in the trolley buses. This is this measurement were provided in the supply area of this substation, Wielkopolska substation, and here is comparison of the effectiveness of recuperative braking before installation of the supercapacitor energy system and after of the installing of the supercapacitor energy storage system and it is present month by month, so there are 12 months and it is possible to see that this red, red lines before installation of supercapacity energy storage system in supply area of this substation because this measurement of course there are limited only to the supply area of the substation with this supercapacitor before installation of the supercapacitor the recovery rate recovery energy rate was between 10 and 20 per percent and after installing of the supercapacitor energy storage system uh, the um, effectiveness of recuperation increased almost two times and already it is between the value of Reusage energy is between 20% to even almost 40%. So it works. And of course, it is the influence of the weather condition. It is visible because during winter, January, February, and December, when when uh, heating works, heating consumes a lot of recuperated energy. So effectiveness of this uh, energy storage system is not very big. But during summer season, you see that that this supercapacity energy system allows to to reduce the energy consumption in 20 percent. And there is another important output of our measurement. Here is presented dependence between density of the traffic. There is the 
average number number of vehicles which are on the supply section and uh, there is proportion between energy recovered to the network consumed by other vehicles which presently are on this supply section and energy recovered thanks to as a result of uh, energy storage system. So, when there are a lot of vehicles on the supply section, almost all recuperated energy can be consumed by other vehicles, as we see on the right side of this, of this, of this uh, graph here. And on the other hand, when there are not much vehicles on the supply system, the probability that one vehicle will be accelerating during second vehicle is breaking is quite small. So in this case, the effectiveness of recuperation to storage energy system is quite big. So here we can gain the main output that um, installation installation uh, of the supercapacity energy storage system is has has sense in case of i can say this part of traffic density when the traffic density is not very big because if the traffic density is big almost all energy can be consumed by the our vehicles Next one, one moment. Oh, here are another photo of all of this supercapacity energy storage system. Outside of the substation was installed display screen which shows the energy which was amount, total amount energy which was saved as a result of this supercapacity energy storage system and equivalent of CO2, CO2 emission which was also reduced as a result of this supercapacitor energy storage system and this kind of promotion. And uh, now I will go to the third part of third part of the part of this presentation. And now our, our already our Trailibus transport company in Gdynia is taking part in, el, in elliptic project and in this project we are going to introduce the modern smart grid, grid tech technologies, especially bilateral supply system in terms of reducing energy consumption. And uh, the main idea is to look at the supply system from the global point of view, from the from the global system approach. And there is basis hem of this idea. We have our generator of energy, this braking vehicle. And this energy can be consumed also, of course, by supercapacitor energy system, but not only, of course, also it can be consumed by the other vehicles and also, for example, can be used to charging electrical vehicles. So it is we can look at the recuperation from the global point of view and uh, to try to configure of supply system to join this free element of reusing of the recuperation and for each traffic situation for each geography situation to find the best solution to best combination of these three elements. And uh, this, it allows for us the smart grid technologies. We have a lot of smart grid technologies. Smart grid technologies are very popular, for example, are being popular in a high voltage system, in energy, energetic system, and also in area of public transport are being more and more popular. For us, for now, there are the more the two elements of smart grid technologies are most interesting. There are one fifth of of this technology is bilateral supply system. And second one is using reusing this energy from re, re, 
cooperation for charging of other vehicles. And what is important, these two technologies can be connected together and it is smart grid effect of smart grid approach of the for the supply system. And here is the idea of uh, I'm, I'm going to present the idea of bilateral of introducing of the bilateral supply system in the most of supply system of public transport, especially in the central on or in the Eastern Europe, there are the decentralized supply system with one side supply of the catenary are the most popular. In this supply system, each supply sector, or here you see supply sections and each supply section is supplied only from one substation. And what does it mean? It does, does mean that, for example, when there is a situation that one vehicle is breaking on the area of one supply substation and there is no reservoir for, for no consumer for example, another vehicle which is accelerating at this time at area of this substation, this energy cannot flow to the other substation because these substations are disconnected. So the idea of bilateral supply system or two-way supply system is in fact very simple. It is just connecting this to substation and this connecting things to the things to this connecting this energy generate band by one vehicle in one traction substation can flow to the supply area of the another vehicle. Idea is very simple but the main problem of this approach is to con coordinate the protection device in this substation and in this substation. So it is the reason why bilateral supply system is not popular, especially in Central Europe or in the Eastern Europe. And uh, I, now we are introducing this bilateral supply system in Vienna, so yet we have no result from measurement, but uh, I will present some um, theoretical simulation and I made simulation of reducing of the energy consumption by introducing of the smart grid technologies in this area of supply system of the natural buses. And uh, already this area, it is interurban line, it is interurban line from Gdynia to city support. And already this interurban line is divided into three parts. It is third part of this, this line second part supplied by the second substation and third part. And already this free, this area of supply of this free substation are disconnected and I made simulation of situation when is introduced the bilateral supply system between this free substation by connecting in this point, this substation and this substation, and by connecting in this point, by this switch, this substation and this substation, and also I calculated how influence, how allow, allows increase the eff efficiency of recuperation installing of the charging point for electric buses. And here is comparison. Here is comparison situation which is already the reducing energy reducing of the energy consumption which can be reached by installing of the supercapacitor energy system and the reducing of the energy consumption as a result of smart grid technologies and As there is presented, the introducing of smart grid te technologies, in, it means connected uh, introducing of the bilateral supply system and using this supply system for charging of the substation allows to reduce the total energy consumption or 
loss to increase the recuperation energy. In fact, in the same level, like installing of the super capacity energy storage system. So now already the reusing of the energy at this particular part of supply system is quite low because the density of traffic is not very big. But as a result of installation of uh, bilateral supply system and using this energy from recuperation for charging, we can increase the efficiency of recuperation more than, than two times. And it is the level all, almost the same like uh, of like we can get after installing of the supercapacity energy storage system, but smart grid technologies are much, much cheaper. And uh, I may, there are some photos uh, how it could be realized. Here is, for example, a photo from Vienna. There is charging of the electric bus from Katadari. It is from tramway system, but from Charlie bus it can be similar. And here is connectors which connect to supply system with remote controls. And some summary. Main summary so is that recuperation is working, uh, even in case of city like Dina, which is rather a flat city without many hills. Also, the recuperation allows to recuperate to to reduce the energy consumption in 40 percent. And uh, again, I will present this scheme, this diagram of energy flow flow in supply system with storage energy system because it is remember that to this is very important to remember that uh, the proper way the best way of uh, reusing of the recuperation in public transport depends on the road condition on the topology of supply system and for example in some situation right here like this part of scheme when the traffic is quite high and almost all energy can be reused by other vehicles. But in the other situation, there are best solution. So for every situation, for every case, there are different solution how to reuse the energy consumption. So how to re increase the reusing of the recuperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mikulai, for the presentation on the recuperation potential in trolleybus systems. Um, so far, I received one question for you, Mikulai, um, which is um, related to the weight of uh, such a super cap module of 1.5 kilowatt hours. So I think the first, the first one you tested. Could you could you repeat? Could you repeat? It's, it's uh, about the weight of such a super cap module of the of 1.5 kilowatt mm, yeah. hours, the first one you installed? Uh, I don't know, in fact, <laughs> because it, it, it was, it was <laughs> the way it's important when it is uh, on board supercapacity energy storage, when it's system, when it is installed in the substation, in fact, the weight doesn't okay. play a role. So. Okay, so I think we will. Um, you will have the time maybe to check the the weight, and then we we give the answer later to to Slobodan who who raised the question. So I think um, there are no more questions I can find in the questions function. I asked uh, one last time if there are direct questions to um, Mikolai. So if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and you can ask your question. And there is one from Suleiman, okay. So I unmute you. Hi, Suleiman. Can you Hi, hear us? Everybody. Yes, I'm uh, Suleiman calling from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I found very interesting this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for all the participants, firstly. Uh, my question for the Mikala is that you now use double end feeding scheme, which is very logical. Have you ever considered about paralleling two lines? of catenary which will reduce more energy losses. Of course, protection-wise, it will be a little bit more difficult. Have you considered about that? Yes, we, you, you, you mean that uh, in 
when oh, the when, is, when is line the line in one direction and opposite the line opposite the line direction is connected together. Correct. Yes. 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 So this is this is standard supply some standard solution in case of tram and tribus line in Poland. So we have it already because here in in case of railway transport it is different, but yes. in case of Plan municipal transport. urban transport it is standard solutions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mikolai. Thank you for your question, Suleiman. Um, just a quick check if there are further questions. Um, if not, this is not the case, uh, and we are quite at the end. I would have some last question um, also to you, Ricardo. Maybe um, we heard also from Mikolai's uh, presentation that it's. Um, of course, very um, and also from you that it's quite important how the uh, how the traffic flow is on these lines due to um, f of, uh, how this uh, impacts the recuperation potential. Um, and with your tool, can you also simulate? I think you can, but it, it, this is the question: Can you simulate scenarios where you have then, for example, separate lines? Um, and because this for us would be of course of interest also for our policy work to prioritize uh, public transport in cities um, that trams, trolleybuses, etc. have uh, separated lines um, and we work against congestion as it looks like that public transport is not only number one congestion fighter but also that the systems work much more energy efficient uh, if they have the chance. Yes, yes, of course. It's not directly. It is not directly um, connected with effectiveness of recuperation, but it is much, much more connected with total energy consumption mm -hmm. because during axle braking and accelerating, we are losing the most of, in fact, the most of energy during braking. So, so. Um, Prioritizing of the public transport allows to reduce the number of braking plays by crossing, and as a result of it, we can generally reduce significantly reduce energy consumption. So yes, it is possible, and I can I can work with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe some final, very short words from you, Ricardo, to this. Yes, so if if I understood well, the question is to see if we could study different traffic conditions. Yes, and the influence on the. Uh, well, yes, yes, we we can do that. Actually, what um, what we use as the inputs to our simulations is the the measured driving cycle of the vehicle. So if there is heavy traffic conditions and low speeds, then we will use that as an input data. And with that, uh, well, we see what is the power needed for acceleration, what's the power that uh, is being caused by the breakings. And uh, normally, if the speeds are low, the potential to, to recover the braking energy is, is low as well. Mm -hmm. That's um, speaking in general. And another thing is, uh, well, we did for the metro. The metro is not influenced by traffic, but um, we simulate different traffic conditions with more vehicles on the line or with only a few vehicles. And actually, the, um, when you have a lot of vehicles, what happens is that the, the vehicles themselves, they exchange already a lot of energy. So they can go to more than 30% of the energy they consume. They can already give it back to the network. What does that mean? That means that if you put a, an energy storage system or a reversible solar station, it's going to improve a little bit, but not so much because the vehicles already are able to give energy back to the network. Um, on the other hand, when the, the situation, when the traffic is the opposite, in the weekends that there is only a few vehicles, then the vehicles themselves, they don't recover so much energy because they don't have anywhere to send it to. So in that case, is when you, when you put your reversible substation or your supercapacitor energy storage, then you can uh, improve a lot the, um, the energy efficiency of your network. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo, for this answer um, and these additional t points. Um, yes, with uh, this, I would like to end the first elliptic webinar on the recuperation uh, energy storage systems 
for trams, metros and, and the trolleybus systems in Brussels and Gdynia. Thank you very much for your participation and once again if you have questions you can either contact me um, as the organizer of this uh, um, webinar or you will get a uh, you can contact the speakers directly you will get an email notification um, when we have published the presentations online on our elliptic project website so have a nice weekend um, thank you once again for your participation I hope you will you will participate once more when we have the second elliptic webinar which will be around autumn time we don't know the yet the uh, the topic of this webinar but we will keep you informed um, about the next actions and sessions in the framework of the elliptic project once again thank you very much and goodbye for today